I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance, the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh, Hutch Jr., laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Steel City Resistance. My name is Hutz Jr., and I am located deep down in the bunker in the city of Pittsburgh. This is episode 79, and I'm just so glad to be with you. Right off the bat, let me uh, let me thank Barb and Byer. Barb uh, adjusted the intro for me, uh, and Byer is the original uh, producer of the intro. So, Barb down there in Georgia, we appreciate that in between the episodes you took care of that that's uh kudos to you and buyer for an excellent product that's a very good sounding intro i like it a lot i do uh i even listen to it when i'm when i'm listening when i'm editing the program um wow do we have a lot of news tonight this is just uh a lot of things are going on ladies and gentlemen and uh you're gonna have to really pay attention i'm gonna try to get through eight stories i don't know if i'm going to be able to do it or not but i've said that before and i'll manage uh what you're going to need to do though to get the full body of the information is to go to the show notes link page uh, on the website so uh you can get the full story there there's no way we'd be here for three hours uh, if i went in depth in every single uh segment uh the next thing uh that i want to talk about a little bit is I i had to I had to have a conversation with myself. I wasn't sure if I was going to read this or not because I, I really have no desire at all to blow my own horn, and it may sound like that uh, when I'm doing this, but that's not the reason. There's a couple reasons uh, that I'm going to read this, and one of them is uh, for the people that wrote it. it. It's always been policy here at the show that if you – take the time out to contact us we will recognize you on the program so uh, that's one reason Uh, and another reason that I'm going to read this is because things like this uh, is why we do shows I mean things like this when if I can touch somebody uh, that just makes it worthwhile makes everything worthwhile and uh, John and Ann, you guaranteed at least another 10 episodes <laughs> with this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a group on Freedom Connector. Go get signed up on Freedom Connector. It's a really good uh, kind of a central hub for people that feel like us. And uh, join my group, uh, Steel City Resistance uh, is a group. And John and Ann are members of the Steel City Resistance. I think we're up to 63 members right now. Uh, which isn't giant, but it's 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 a lot bigger than a lot of other ones. Uh, but John and Ann are members, and they wrote a a message to me. I always post the show notes, not the show notes that I use, the show notes that I write while I'm editing the program. Uh, podcast to to be a decent podcast, you have to have show notes. So that's just something that's part of the process of of editing the show. Uh, a lot of sites won't feature them if you if you don't have show notes. But uh, John and Ann replied to last week's show notes. Bless you, Hutch, for caring so much about us and the information that we need to have. Prayers go out for Ward that he will be able to accomplish what he feels is being called to do in this next season. And for you, that you will experience extra stamina and focus to keep things going. We appreciate all you do. Well... I can't tell you how much I appreciate you writing that, John and Ann, because uh, it just makes it that much easier. Uh, Ward wrote back, thank you for your kind words and thoughts. No, I'm not even going to read that. I should. Ward took time to write it. But if there is one person that I would trust with this job, it would be Hutch. I have never met someone with the commitment and drive as Hutch. Remember, we will never give up. We will never quit. We will win. And that is a fact. And... That's going to be part of the program uh, this evening. And I wrote back, wow, thanks to everyone for the kind and encouraging words. 
We are heading down the stretch, and the show must go on. How true. So anyway, thank you very much, John and Ann. That was, uh, I wasn't expecting that, especially on Freedom Connector, uh, but it, it really feels good, and I enjoy what I'm doing, and I know that the, uh, the mainstream media, there's a couple things. The mainstream media, we're not going to destroy the mainstream media. What we have to do is we have to become the mainstream media. The mainstream is the mainstream. It's not the media. It's the mainstream. And we have to get our voices in the mainstream. And I've spoken about this many times. The only way you can do that is take back the culture. And there's a lot of people that are out there doing that right now. Uh, you can thank Glenn Beck. He's having a, uh, I don't, an event in Dallas, Texas uh, in a couple weeks. And, and he's, he's realized that in order to be mainstream, you have to be mainstream. So there's a lot of music involved with it. There's a lot of Hollywood type things involved with it. And uh, anyway, that's just uh, my feelings on that. You, uh, the, the mainstream anyway, what's the mainstream media right now? I think we already are. I do. When you look at the, at the ratings of the different networks, uh, but the networks are just, uh, they're lying. The networks are lying for the president the president is lying and we're in a situation now ladies and gentlemen where we cannot rely see what we've done what conservatives have done and i'm paraphrasing some things that i heard that really uh, stood out to me these are not my initial, original uh thoughts but what conservatives do is conservatives worry about civics and democrats worry about liberals leftists worry about policy they worry about dealing with policy and getting policy change. So that's why Washington never changes, because Republicans are worried about civics and how things are supposed to happen. Well, anyway, it doesn't work like that anymore. You cannot anymore. You can't depend on the media to give you an honest representation of what's going on. You cannot re rely on the Supreme Court of the United States to follow or, or protect the Constitution. That's obvious. You can't anymore. So what have we got left, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I mean, until we get rid of all the Republican whores that are in Congress, that are in there just to be in there and go along to get along, we got to get rid of more of them and get some principled people in there. Uh, but it's up to us, ladies and gentlemen. It's no longer, it's no, we can no longer just sit back and, and, and think if something is unconstitutional and it gets to the Supreme Court that they'll take care of it because it's not like that anymore. We've got some rebuilding that we have to do. And in the meantime, one thing about the, the founders, the founders were brilliant in that they included us in the equation. So now it's up to us to get the word to other people. Tell your friends, get some more people listening to the program. Uh, we got to get some principal people elected in Washington. Now there's a, a good side to this. Uh, the good side is is that we're winning. We are absolutely winning, ladies and gentlemen. When you see grown men and women in politics openly lying, when the lie is easily proven, we're winning. If that's all they have, then that's all they have left. Be prepared for more lies. But now at least there's a new media that can counterattack any lies right away. Uh, the thing is, is if, if you know anybody that is relying solely on network television for their news, please alert them. Get them to change. Show them where the Drudge Report is. Show them where this show is. Uh, but we're winning. We are definitely winning. It's going to be a hard fight. But when they're doing this, uh, they have nothing left. I mean, when they have the race card and this Bain Capital card. Is, is I mean, it's fiction. And the president has put out uh, an ad echoing this fiction and it's just uh it's unbelievable but anyway you can rest assured that if they're doing that it's because they can't run on any type of factual data or information or ideas or, or anything so the progressives are on their heels a little bit they're not going to tell you that i, I want to say something else too uh during this last stretch uh of the campaign season there's only a hundred and some days left uh, but but one thing I want you to remember, especially you people that are a little younger that didn't live through it, 
Ronald Reagan was tied with Jimmy Carter, or even behind Jimmy Carter, all the way up until the election. I mean, he got a little bit of a bounce, I think, after the convention. But it was the same as this. And Reagan crushed Jimmy Carter. So just keep that in mind. These polls are not that accurate. People aren't really paying attention yet. What we have to do is we have to talk to people. That's what you got to do. Become the political go-to person in your group of people. And don't be afraid to say something. Uh, we we got to win this. It's our, it's our last shot. I mean, this is something that's... Uh, it's critical for the United States of America and for liberty. And you know that already. You wouldn't be listening to this show. Uh, but again, for them to act like this and tell these bold-faced lies and call Mitt Romney. Who's going to call Mitt Romney a felon? Mitt Romney, like Charles Krauthammer, in, <laughs> Charles Krauthammer said, he doesn't just not have any skeletons in his closet. He doesn't even have a closet. You know, so they can come out with this stuff all day long and these fake political operatives that work for these networks can stand in front of a camera and they can, you know, lie to, and, and their, their time will come. Their time will come. Credibility is running out the door and, uh, pretty soon nobody's going to pay attention to them. It, it's, it's all, it's comedy anymore. Uh, but something else happened because <laughs> this blows me away, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Clinton, uh, was president while Newt Gingrich presided over Congress, over the House of Representatives, and uh, it was a conservative, well, no, it wasn't. It was a, a Republican Congress, and they passed welfare reform together. And Bill Clinton, even though I know he hated it, you know, pretended to be proud of, proud of it uh, because it, it got, it, it created a, a an atmosphere, an environment that would couple receiving welfare benefits with working and a path back to work to get off welfare. Welfare is supposed to be temporary on the conservative side. On the leftist side, it's a way to enslave people and buy votes. So what did Obama do a couple days ago? It was too late for me to enter it into the official notes. He directed Department of Health and Human Services, Kathleen the alien-looking Sebelius, to drop the work requirement for future welfare benefits. Illegal as hell. Not going to stand up in court. Well, I don't know. You never know these days. John Roberts might think it's good to go, you know. But uh, anyway, so now there's a incentive for people to get free money and never work again. So that's just something that... uh kind of irked me and I wanted to put in the put in your minds we'll we'll get into that in more detail during the next week and uh, we might have something to report on it on next week's show a uh, friend of the show Pete Grubbs is a musician ladies and gentlemen back in the early days of the show I believe we even played one of his songs on here uh, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to I'm going to give you this web address and i'm going to also post it it's posted and you know what i'll one better it's posted on the show notes links page go to the show notes links page you can hit a link you can listen to pete grubb's song the song is uh still standing i remembered that pete it's not even written on my notes it's still standing and it's about uh our 9-11 experience and that we're still standing uh it's a good song go up there listen to it doesn't cost you anything vote for it uh, there's a whole lot of applicants, and he's he's in like 45th place, but there's like a lot of applicants. So uh, let's try to move him up, ladies and gentlemen. Pete Grubbs with uh, Still Standing, and the uh, link is on the show notes page. And now your weekly jihad report for July 7th through the 13th. 42 jihad attacks, three Allah Akbars, that's a suicide attack, 268 dead bodies, and 575 people critically injured due to the religion of peace. One body at a time. This next uh, story, now that we're going to get into them, is titled, this is so true too, The Rise of Food Stamp Nation. Tom Vilsack is one of the most important welfare administrators in the nation. Oh yeah, but he's the Secretary of Agriculture. 
two-thirds of the Agriculture Department's budget is devoted to welfare programs. The biggest is food stamps. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Two-thirds. There's farms from coast to coast in this country, and two-thirds of the Agriculture Department's budget is devoted to welfare programs. The biggest is food stamps, which is now the nation's second largest welfare program after Medicaid. It's inexorable growth during the past decade through good times and bad is a testament to government's self-generating expansion. Asked what labor wanted, the great 20th century union leader Samuel Gompers answered, more. The modern welfare state lives by the same credo. About 17 million people received food stamps back in 2000. Some 30 million received them in 2008. Roughly 46 million people receive them today. From 1 in 50 Americans on food stamps at the program's national inception in the 1970s, 1 in 7 Americans are on them now. The grinding recession accounts for much of the increase of the past through few years, but not for its entirety. Spending on food stamps doubled between 01 and 06, even though unemployment was low in those years. Even when the economy is projected to improve in the future, usage of food stamps will remain elevated above historic norms. Food Stamp Nation is here to stay. One of its pillars is so-called categorical eligibility, which means that if someone is eligible for another welfare program, they are presumably eligible for food stamps. In 2000, the Clinton administration issued regulations saying that merely getting a non-cash welfare benefit could make someone eligible. Getting a welfare brochure or referred to an 800 number for services is enough to qualify in almost all states. Categorical eligibility effectively wiped out the program's old asset test. You couldn't have $30,000 in the bank and get food stamps. Although income limits still apply, in the Obama stimulus, the work requirement was suspended. And it hasn't been restored. The requirement had discouraged young, able-bodied non-parents from utilizing the program. There are millions of them on food stamps. Shame. The bottom line is that government at all levels actually wants people on the program. Newt Gingrich famously calls Barack Obama the food stamp president. But the first president worthy of the moniker was George W. Bush. His administration brought a Madison Avenue element to the otherwise unreconstructed Great Society program. Not everyone who is eligible for food stamp knows it or wants to sign up. Bush began a recruitment campaign. In the same vein, the Obama administration is running radio ads hailing food stamps, I call them grub stubs, uh, as a way to lose weight. At the local level, county governments spread the word and work to overcome residual cultural resistance to taking government benefits. The federal government pays $50 million in bonuses to states for signing people up. Man. That the food stamps program is part of the Farm Bill, now up for debate in Congress, is itself a scam, an exercise in rural-urban log rolling that gives everyone an interest in seeing the bill pass. As every level of government works to grow the program, attempts to scale it back are predictably savaged. When Jeff Sessions, a Republican senator from Alabama, advocated reforms to save $20 billion out of a $770 billion budget for food, that's almost a trillion dollars budget for food stamps during the next decade he was portrayed as a Dick Dickensian villain the New York Democrat Kirsten Gillibrand accused him of not caring about kids and insisted that food stamps are an engine of economic growth since every one dollar spent on the program allegedly generates one dollar and 71 cents in economic activity there's nothing apparently that food stamps can't do needless to say there are destitute people who need help but the goal should be to reduce dependence on food stamps to historic levels after the recession and restore the asset test, reestablish a work requirement, and implement a better system for income verification. When almost 15% of Americans are on food stamps, the government should reacquaint itself with two words, too much. Wow, that's, that's just uh, true. <laughs> it's true. It's something. It has to be... We have to get back to the to the place. Now, I gotta say, I gotta I got a full disclosure here. When I was growing up in the seventies, my father got sick and we were on food stamps for a short time. And we have to get back to the way we were. 
we were on food stamps to where you would pay $40 and they would give you $80 in Monopoly money that you could only get certain things with. And we used them to, to buy food. I mean, we used every one of them. But uh, we were embarrassed to be on food stamps. I mean, I was. So teach your children right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this next one, uh, this, is, this is a sign of how tough it's going to be. One man that the left hates and they're scared of, they're terrified of this man, is retired Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, representative out of Florida. Shark Tank has leaked a memo of Soros-backed super PAC targeting Alan West. Alan West wasn't lying when he said he was the number one target for defeat of the Democratic Party. The Dump West super PAC, backed by George Soros himself, is taking aim at conservative Congressman Alan West. As we reported earlier, a top national Democrat operative has been retained by a new George Soros-backed super PAC to target Cong Congressman Alan West for defeat this November. The super PAC has been christened Dump West and is expected to file with the Federal Election Commission early next week. Sources have told the Shark, the shark Tank that a website along with a targeted web advertising campaign will soon be launched. Democratic House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi asked former Congressman Larry Smith, who's now working as a lobbyist, to help line up initial funding for the group. West is said to be at the top of Pelosi's hit list. I'll bet he is. Sources have also uh, told us that the left-wing billionaire George Soros is among those who committed to a $5 million war chest to defeat West. It's not surprising that the hard left is seeking to beat West, said Florida Tea Party leader Eric Von Tausch. West's a conservative hero. Our source has confirmed that the PAC will indeed file early next week, most probably on Tuesday, and hope to immediately start fundraising. Now, this comes to, to the part uh, that I, I talked about at the beginning of the show on we only have each other to rely on here. You know, if, if we're going to make a difference, we can sit here and have podcasts all day. That's going to help a little bit. You know, you can talk to your friends and everything. Uh, but the real way to make a difference is to help these people. You know, if, if you know that, that George... Or, uh, yeah, George Soros is targeting Alan West. Alan West, to me, is one of the top members of Congress in the whole government. I would vote for Alan West for president right now. He does not mess around, and he's, he's honest. Honesty is, is, is key. So if you can help the man, that's a guy to help right there to counter that $5 million war chest because we can't, we can't lose people like Alan West. Alan West has higher calling than being a representative from Georgia, I mean Florida. So let's say if it's possible, if you can help them, or if you know somebody that can help them. Uh, there's some other uh, really, really disturbing uh, information that, that's floating through the, through the information channels now. Uh, there's not really a whole lot of chance of any type of laws being passed uh, just due to the deadlock, which is intentional in Congress. There's nothing wrong with Congress. Congress was designed the, the way it is. Uh, but there's another way that our constitutional rights can be taken from us. And the way that you can take a constitutional right away from an American is by treaties. Treaties have to be, if treaties are ratified by the Senate and approved by the president, they're damn near like, constitutional law themselves so you really need to pay attention to this one it's uh sneaking through it's hillary clinton loves it uh it's it's part of the thing the president was talking about when he talked about to jim brady's wife about he's got stuff going on under the radar other than fast and furious and uh the nra is standing uh firm against this the nra u.n arms treaty must exclude civilian weapons. It currently does not. The National Rifle Association has demanded that the United Nations leave civilian weapons out of a treaty on international arms sales that it is negotiating this month. Wayne LaPierre, the group's CEO, warned Wednesday that the treaty won't pass Congress if it does include restrictions on civilian arms, as this would trump Americans' right to bear arms under the Second Amendment, the Hill reports. 
He said 58 senators have promised to oppose a treaty that covers civilian weapons. A U.N. treaty would need approval from two-thirds of the Senate to become law in the United States. I am here to announce the NRA's strong opposition to anti-freedom policies that disregard American citizens' right to self-defense. No foreign influence has jurisdiction over the freedoms our founding fathers guaranteed to us, LaPierre said at the U.N. Arms Trade Treaty Conference. The only way to address NRA's objections is to simply and completely remove civilian firearms from the scope of the treaty. That is the only solution. On that, there will be no compromise. The 58 senators cited by LaPierre signed a letter to President Barack Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on the issue. The note, written by Senators Jerry Moran, Republican Kansas, and John Tester, Democrat, Montana, doesn't completely reject regulation of civilian arms sales, but indicated it will be difficult for Congress to pass a treaty including civilian arms. The senators oppose any inclusion of small arms, light weapons, ammunition, or related materials that would make the treaty overly broad and virtually unenforceable, the letter says. The senators can't accept the treaty that in any way restricts the rights of law-abiding U.S. citizens to manufacture, assemble, possess, transfer, or purchase firearms, ammunition, and related items. Treaty proponents say keeping civilian weapons out of the agreement would make it easier for terrorists and rogue regimes to gain deadly arms. And they say there's no need to worry about the Second Amendment as the Constitution trumps international law. Well, all I can say is pay attention to the representative senators, etc., that are for this in its original uh, state. Because there's a lot of people out there that want to take your guns away. Trust me on that. That's just a fact. Uh, and the, this is the way that they kind of go about doing it. And, and your friends that are only watching the media on the networks aren't going to hear about that story. They, they didn't hear. It's a fact that they did not hear about the, the House bill that rejected Obamacare, that, that the House voted in favor of repealing Obamacare with five Democrat senators. That didn't even make one of the networks in the morning. Uh, <laughs> thank God for the internet. Huh? Why the West loves lying to itself about Islam. You ever wonder about that? I mean, they do. Uh, you know that, that internet email that you got about that Nigerian guy that, with the bank? And say you get a tempting offer from a Nigerian prince and decide to, decide to invest some money in helping him transfer his vast fortune from Burkina Faso or Dubai over to the bank across the street. The seemingly simple task of bringing over the $18 million left to him by his father hits some snags which require you to put in more and more of your own money. Eventually, you have invested more than you ever would have done up front just trying to protect the sunk cost, the money that you already sank into Pr Prince Hussein Nagobo's scheme. And to protect your self-esteem, you must go on believing that no matter what Prince Nagobo does, he is credible and sincere. Any failings in the interaction excuse me, must be your fault. Anyone who tells you otherwise must be a Nagobophobe. Now imagine that Prince Nagobo's real name is Islam. That's where Western elites find themselves now. They've invested heavily in the illusion of a compatible Islamic civilization. Those investments, whether in Islamic immigration or Islamic democracy or peace with Islam, have turned toxic. But dropping those investments is as out of the question as writing off Prince Nagobo as a con artist and walking away feeling like a fool. Western elites who fancy themselves more intelligent and more enlightened than the wise men and prophets of every religion and who base their entire right to rule on that intelligence and enlightenment are not in the habit of admitting they are fools. The Arab Springers, who predicted that the Muslim uprisings would bring a new age of secularism, freedom, like Bill Kristol, remember him, and an end to the violence between Islam and the West, are busy writing up new checks. Thomas Friedman is penning essays, explaining why the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood will mean regional stability and peace with Israel, and if it doesn't, it'll be our fault. It's not insanity. It's the term that rhymes with a certain river in Egypt. 
The Brotherhood's victory discredits the Arab Spring, which discredits the bid for Arab democracy, which discredits the compatibility of Islam and the folks on Fifth Avenue. Follow the river back along its course, and suddenly the clash of civilizations becomes an undeniable fact. It's easier to give up and let the river of denial carry you further along until five years from now you find yourself explaining why al-Qaeda ruling Libya is actually a good thing for everyone. The Arab Spring, the Palestinian peace process, and every, every similar bid to transform the region presumed that disempowerment was the cause of Muslim violence and that conversely, empowerment was the solution. Give the poor deer some weapons, a country, a ballot box, free and open elections, and they'll be less likely to blow themselves up while seeking 72 virgins on the downtown express. Instead, empowering people who were violent while disempowered only made them more violent. Some of the best minds in two hemispheres are engaged in seeking a solution to this paradox, which isn't a paradox at all, but rather a straight line projection. If Abdul is beheading people when all he has to work with is a sword, then if you give him a gun, he'll start shooting them instead. If he's blowing up buses when he only has a terrorist group, he will blow up countries when he has a country. Empowering Abdul does not diminish his grievances because his grievances are a function of his capacity for violence. Increasing his capacity will increase his grievances until the entire world is on the wrong end of his empowerment scimitar. The liberal projection that Abdul plus power plus money plus bigger guns equal peace made as much sense as Prince Nagobo's story about his transfer of fees cursed by witches, but as the song goes, you gotta have faith. Some of the things that we have faith in are bigger than us, and some are just us. Those who put their faith in Prince Nagobo and in the benign nature of Islam are really putting, faith, putting their faith in their own instincts, trusting that they are right, even while looking into the eye of wrongness. The sunk cost of the free world into the illusion that Islam is benign, that it is a positive influence, and that it can be coexisted with is enormous. Even the dollar, euro, and shekel costs make the wildest fraud seem tame. The mechanism of denial is that sunk cost, that faith which our political, cultural, and academic superiors have in themselves, in their probity, their insight, and their rational tools of scientific governance. Muslims dare not question Islam because they fear Allah. Leftists dare not question Islam because they fear being fools. If they were completely wrong about Islam, then what else were they also wrong about? Pull at one thread and the whole dream coat dissolves, leaving behind a very naked emperor. The longer the fraud goes on, the more impossible it is for them to admit that they were wrong. What could have been tossed out after a year is an article of faith after 20 and undeniable after, uh, after 40? To admit that you made a mistake right away is bearable, but to admit that you, your policy for generations has been complete moon-baked lunacy is inconceivable. Most insidiously, the left likes the imaginary world it has created, the multicultural utopia with jolly Pakistanis adding spice to London, Saudis putting up little mosques on the Canadian prairie, and sassy Shiites bringing diversity to Dearborn isn't just propaganda, it's the imaginary world that they want to live in. The illusion of Islam has, like the banking system, become too big to fail. It cannot fail because it would take too much else down with it, leaving behind a harder world. No matter how unintegrated Muslims in Europe are, the Eurocrats must insist that aside from a few exploding bumps in the road, everything is going according to plan. Any day now, a lesbian imam will be preaching the virtues of secularism in Finsbury Park. It must be that way because the alternative is unthinkable. In Israel, the two-state solution must still be the solution because the alternative is eternal conflict. In the rest of the region, Arab democracy must be viable because otherwise there is nothing left but despair over an irredeemable, bar irredeemable barbarism. we got to have faith not in any deity, including the chief deity of Islam, but in our leaders. Muslims believe that Allah is infallible, while we are expected to believe that the politicians and professors, the diplomats and journalists are, that they are right, even when the continuing violence proves that they are wrong. 
The people who shape our half of the world have fallen for the Nigerian prince scam of Islam. And when the check from Lagos doesn't clear, when the bombs go off, the cars burn, the children are murdered in schools, and the rockets fly, then they don't blame Prince Hussein the Gobo, the car bombers, terrorists, and throat slitters. They blame us for not believing in it, too. Chilling, but so true. Uh, we have to get a handle on this. Uh, we have to start having an adult conversation about this. The evidence is everywhere. It is everywhere. These people are the most evil people, at least the ones that follow the teachings are the most evil, the things they do to their women. I mean, if you've been listening to the show, if not research through the archives, look yourself, look up gender mutilation, look up Islamic gender mutilation for one and the different, uh, the different ways they do that. It's, it's sickening. It's just sickening. Uh, you got to make sure that you, uh, like our Facebook page. Uh, Facebook.com slash Steel City Resistance. There's a lot of, uh, in between episodes, there's a lot of breaking material uh, that I post on there. And feel free for you to post something on there on the timeline. That's fine. Uh, sticking with Islam for a couple minutes, uh, th this is a perfect reflection of the content of that last story. As Islamists pledge to wipe out Christianity, government study says not to worry. In the wake of the news that is an in the wake of the news that an Islamist group affiliated with the United Muslim Nations International has announced their intentions to destroy Christianity and wipe it from the face of the earth, a U.S. government-sponsored study, excuse me, has been released that says Muslim terrorists are widely misunderstood and don't wish to impose Islam around the world as is commonly believed in the West. Whoever wrote that is either stupid. Or committing treason, because that's a goddamn lie. Back on Earth, Islamist leader Sheikh Farouk al Mohammadi has announced the revived global caliphate that has set eyes on the West to once and for all rid the world of Christianity and to Islamize countries like the United States. But never fear, the U.S. government sponsored study says that Islamists are not an aggressive, offensive foe seeking domination and conquest of unbelievers, as is commonly assumed. Never mind that the one constant in Islamist, in Islamist history is conquest, and that even now, in the wake of the Arab Spring, Christians in the Middle East increasingly find that their options are limited to either recanting their faith, being whipped or otherwise punished, or being killed. By the way, our department of our department of defense paid millions paid millions of dollars to fund this worthless study which is a shame when you think that they could have just spent 2 dollars for a cup of coffee in starbucks surfed the internet for 15 minutes while drinking it and discovered enough information that one in that one search to prove that islamists are daily issuing the same ultimatum to westerners the world over convert or be conquered it's just the truth, you know, and, and for our government, this is one of the reasons that turned me to Alan West, aside from the Army affiliation. Uh, he gets it. He knows the deal. Straight up, no doubt about it. Alan West would deal with this. Uh, Got to get him in first, though. I mean, and there's some some scary, a scary situation developing uh, that I just don't know. I can't figure out why. The president would go down this road when it's so, uh, I mean, I know he wants to do these things, but you would just think that this is just a little too much. Uh, nine border patrol offices to be closed. In mid-June, as Congress refused to pass the DREAM Act, Obama went around Congress and announced quasi-amnesty for over 800,000 young illegals in America. When the Supreme Court upheld the portion of Arizona's immigration law that required police officers to check the identification of immigrants who come into contact with law enforcement, Obama went around the Supreme Court and immediately suspended deportation of illegal immigrants who might be detained in Arizona. The message was clear. If you're here, you can stay. And now he's going a step further in making it easier for illegal immigrants to get here 
in the first place. Obama is doing this by shutting down nine Border Patrol stations across four states. Law enforcement in areas affected by the closures say this means catching a car full of illegal immigrants will now include holding those immigrants for up to eight hours while the nearest Border Patrol agent arrives. Up till now, the Border Patrol agents have been right alongside the police officers. The Border Patrol offices to be closed... Listen to this. This is... The Border Patrol offices to be closed are in high human trafficking and drug smuggling areas, and the Obama administration believes concerns over the closures are being blown out of proportion because the agents in those offices aren't being terminated. Rather, they are being reassigned to hot spots along the actual southern border. They're already in hot spots. Yet, as Fox News reported, Representatives Mac Thornberry and Randy Nugabauer don't agree, they're both from Texas, don't agree with the administration on this. The Border Patrol offices in their cities, Amarillo and Lubbock, have apprehended 633 illegal immigrants in the first part of this year alone, yet they are scheduled to be closed. Who is going to be apprehending illegal immigrants in cities like Amarillo and Lubbock once Obama takes their Border Patrol agents away? And, and let's remember, let's, let's remember back to some past episodes, it's not just Mexicans coming across the border. There's Islamic terrorist types coming across the border. And it gets even worse, ladies and gentlemen. It just gets even worse. And for those of you watching GB or TV, for those of you watching SCR TV, uh, I just threw a picture up on the screen. Huge tunnel found near Yuma, Arizona. DEA agents found a drug tunnel in a one-story building in San Luis, Arizona, July 7th. Authorities in Arizona have discovered a lighted, ventilated, cross-border drug smuggling tunnel more than two football fields long and possibly linked to the Sinaloa drug cartel just steps from an official border crossing checkpoint between Mexico and the United States. Local and federal officials found the tunnel's entrance hidden under a water tank in a one-story building in San Luis, Arizona, near Yuma. The tunnel then plunged 55 feet down before turning south for Mexico. The 240-yard tunnel, which had six-foot ceilings, lighting, and ventilation, surfaced across the border inside an ice factory in San Luis, Rio, Colorado, Mexico. Drug Enforcement Administration agents had been monitoring the building on the U.S. side since January after seeing what they considered suspicious activity that indicated the site was being used as a, p a potential stash location, said the DEA in a statement on July 6th. The local law enforcement stopped the pickup truck carrying 39 pounds of methamphetamine and then traced the vehicle back to the San Luis building. The recent discovery of this sophisticated drug smuggling tunnel is yet another reminder of how desperate these criminal organizations are and the extent they will go to further their drug dealing operations and endanger the security of our citizens, said Doug Coleman, special agent in charge of the DEA's Phoenix Field Division. The DEA continues to work with our counterparts nationally and internationally to bring justice to these drug trafficking organizations as well as to block their smuggling routes into this country. Coleman estimated that the tunnel cost a million to $1.5 million to construct and took a year to complete. And based on what we discovered in there, said Coleman, and based on our experience, the tunnel was not operational for very long. Coleman said it would be a fairly educated guess to assume the tunnel was linked to the Sin Sinaloa cartel, which is active in the Arizona border region. After U.S. officials discovered the four-foot-wide tunnel entrance in San Luis, which was surrounded by drums full of the dirt removed from the tunnel, the Mexican military traced the tunnel to its entrance inside the Mexican ice plant. Bags of dirt removed from the tunnel were stacked to the factory's ceiling. Three suspects have been detained in the United States in connection with the tunnel. The San Luis Tunnel is the first fully operational smuggling tunnel found in the Yuma area, according to the DEA. In the past 10 years, 89 cross-tunnel borders have been found in Arizona and 50 in neighboring California. According to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, the first sophisticated smuggling tunnel was found in Douglas, Arizona, more than 20 years ago. Many tunnels have included lighting, ventilation, and beam-supported walls and ceilings 
In the past seven years, 119 tunnels have been discovered on the southern U.S. border. Only one tunnel has been found on the U.S. US Canada border. Now, personally, I'm more concerned with the uh, jihadists than I am with the drug runners. I mean, I, I served in Korea, ladies and gentlemen, in the Second Infantry Division, and uh, there was three known tunnels in the Republic of Korea. One of them had train tracks under the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone of 38th Parallel, uh, the border between North and South Korea. And the one on our side, I mean, you had to walk down for five, ten minutes to get to the, like, where the DMZ was on the surface. Well, we went down, the South Korean, the Rock Army, Republic of Korea Army, went down in the tunnel once we found it, and somehow they used uh, distance to determine where the DMZ was, and they mined and put barbed wire and all kinds of obstacles you know, in a, in a zone in front of them and set up a machine gun. There was one Rock Army guy down there with an M60 machine gun and about 10,000 rounds of ammunition. I don't know what else he had. He probably had uh, a detonator to uh, use C4 to cave the thing in. I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that's I, I think of tunnels. I think of military operations. I could see them sending uh, sending some people to, to Allah Akbar through there. I don't know, but that's uh, the, the reason I put the story in there at the same time that we're closing down border patrol stations and we're telling Arizona that we're not going to uh, do any type of assistance down there. I mean, this is just bizarre. This is bizarre. I, I'll tell you what, if anything happens, if it was me and, and somebody in my family got hurt or, or something like that, sue the federal government. It's their fault. I mean, it's you can prove it. It's unbelievable. Now, another thing that didn't get reported uh, in the media, it was, to, it was reported, but it, it wasn't reported correctly. Uh, Mitt Romney knows full well that the NAACP is not going to support him because Obama is black and because Obama is a leftist, because the NAACP has turned into a leftist political organization. It's a shame because it's a storied, storied group that did a lot of good things. Uh, but the, the only storyline, there was a couple storylines of uh, Mitt Romney's visit to the NAACP. One was that he got booed, and he did. When he mentioned Obamacare by name, he got booed. People booed. I don't know if everybody booed, but it, there was an audible uh, couple seconds of him getting booed. No question about it. Uh, then the other storyline was, uh, that he was, he just went there to talk to his base, which I still don't understand that one. You know, like he went there, he got booed on purpose. That's what Nancy Pelosi said. Nancy Pelosi said that Mitt Romney went there, him going there and getting booed, she said was a very calculated move that he did on purpose. <laughs> and if you heard the speech, and I did, uh, what Mitt Romney was doing was Mitt Romney was recognizing a room full of African, a room full of black Americans and recognizing them as intelligent people that make their own decisions, something that nobody else does with them. And he did. He went in there and he didn't uh, change his voice. He didn't do a Hillary Clinton and I'm in no ways tied. He didn't do any of that. He went in there and he spoke the same message that he spoke, that he, that he gave in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, the same exact message told him exactly what he's going to do, told him that you'll agree with some things and you won't agree with other things, but I'll be your president too. Not like this guy. You know, this guy's only certain special interest groups president. Mitt Romney straight up said, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be your president too. I want to help you too. And he, he laid out how. And he laid out the, the just terrible treatment that these people are getting from Barack Obama and company. I mean, uh, the young youth black unemployment is like 45, 50%, you know, and, and there's no, nothing that's going to change that in anything that Barack Obama is going to do, you know, just not at all. But Mitt Romney went in there 
and he got booed, and it didn't even slow him down. But what didn't get covered was Mitt, Mitt Romney getting a standing ovation at the end. Amid all the reports and punditry about Mitt Romney's hostile reception at the NAACP conference Wednesday, the standing ovation that the Republican presidential candidate received at the end of his speech has been largely overlooked. This unexpected audience reaction was triggered by Romney's closing remarks about his admiration for his father, former Michigan Governor George Romney, and the role he played in the civil rights movement despite criticism from his party and his church. Here's the excerpt. For every one of us, a particular person comes to mind, someone who set a standard of conduct and made us better by their example. For me, that man is my father, George Romney. It wasn't just that my dad helped me write the self, or helped write the civil rights provision for the Michigan Constitution, though he did. It wasn't just that he helped create Michigan's first civil rights commission, or that as governor he marched for civil rights in Detroit, though he did those things too. More than these public acts, it was the kind of man that he was, and the way he dealt with every person, black or white. He was a man of the fairest instincts and a man of faith who knew that every person was a child of God. I'm grateful to him for so many things, and above all, for the knowledge of God, whose ways are not always our ways, but whose justice is certain and whose mercy endures forever. This nod to the Romney family's Mormon faith is a veiled allusion to largely unspoken tensions that underscored Romney's appearance at the NAACP conference, and the audience's respectful ovation illustrates why the speech was actually a very significant moment in Romney's presidential campaign. And then it goes on to explain the history. For most of its history, the Church of Latter-day Saints, or Mormon Church, excluded African-American men from the priesthood, an ordination given to most married Mormon men in good standing with the church. The Mormon Church does not have a full-time salary clergy, so virtually all Mormon heads of households are considered priests. Brigham Young, the second head of the Mormon Church, taught that all black people were under the curse of Cain, ordaining that any man having one drop of the seed of Cain in him cannot hold the priesthood, and if no other prophet ever spake it before, I will say it now in the name of Jesus Christ. The church followed this mandate for more than a hundred years, resisting numerous entreaties to end its exclusionary practices during the civil rights movement, including several by the NAACP. The position was finally reversed in 1978 when the church declared that it would extend to every worthy member of the church all of the privileges and blessings which the gospel affords. Interestingly, the shift is widely believed to have been driven by the problem of who would lead the church's expansion into Brazil and other ethnically diverse countries, rather than by concerns of racial equality. Today, only about 3% of the roughly 6.1 million Mormons in the U.S. identify as black. Mitt Romney's assumption of a leadership role in Boston's Mormon church coincides with the church's shift in its stance toward accepting African Americans into the priesthood, and there is little reason to believe that Romney opposed the change. In fact, he has called the reversal one of the most emotional and happy days of my life, and he said he broke into tears when he heard the news of the change. So that's a little bit of background on that. And, uh, yeah, that was, uh, and then as, a, as the first Mormon presidential candidate of a major party, challenging the country's first black president, Romney had to accept the NAACP's invitation or risk opening himself up to uncomfortable questions about his willingness to accept the black community. To that end, Romney's NAACP speech was actually quite significant and surprisingly successful. While his message was forcefully rejected, the farewell standing ovation suggests that the gest his gesture was at the very least appreciated. And like he, I said, he went in there and, and he treated them like adults and dignified people. He didn't go in there like Al Gore and, and start uh, imitating a, you know, a Baptist preacher. I mean, these people have just been embarrassing over the years if you think about it. I mean, unbelievable. But it's... Uh, it's something that I, I think that you're going to see a surprising amount of uh, black Americans breaking from Obama. I mean, anybody, anybody who's out looking for looking over their own family, looking out for their own f family, uh, 
how could you vote for these people and be, I mean, because of skin, really? Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, we're <laughs> time's going to tell on this one. Uh, but I still, I, I've heard people say things. I've heard them call radio stations. I've seen them on Facebook. I've seen them on Twitter. I mean, I don't, I don't see how you vote for this guy. I don't care what color he is. I mean, he's a freaking Marxist. This guy's going down the, down the trail with uh, his his mentor, and his name escapes me right now. Uh, we're gonna have something on him next week. Uh, his communist mentor that I can't remember. Frank Marshall Davis. Frank Marshall Davis, another horrible black man, uh, communist, card carrying communist. He's on the FBI's list. That if we ever go to war with the Soviet Union, he gets scarfed up. You know, it's one of those guys. This is his mentor, his main. You might as well call him his father. And and the media just failed. The media failed miserably, never vetted him. I mean, every time something comes out about Barack Obama, the media gets taken down another notch for failing to do their job. Uh, I mean, it's almost treasonous. That word's starting to get thrown around here a little bit, you know? People are going to have to start... Uh, being held accountable for the things that they're doing against this nation's security. I mean, Hillary Clinton has a spawn of the Muslim sisterhood as her chief of staff, her main assistant, married to a scumbag Weinstein, whatever, Wiener, Wiener. How does a, how does a member of the Muslim sisterhood marry a Jew and there's not something going on? Explain that to me. Explain that one to me. Just that that's all you need to explain to me. Jesus Christ. And another breaking news story came in right at the last minute, ladies and gentlemen. It's kind of serious. We're gonna have to watch it. Apparently, Syria moved their chemical weapons, and it's very worrisome given that Assad's precarious position and his desperation, man. I mean, he's got sarin gas, which is nerve agent, which is concentrated raid, is what it is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that kills humans. Uh, now they've only they've only moved them around. They haven't used them, and and they're saying that uh, incidentally the Russians are coming. The Russians have a warship loaded with uh, Soviet helicopters for Syria. They also it's said to have Marines on board, Russian Marines. Uh, so who knows what's going to happen here? I mean, I don't know, but uh, I know that people in the Middle East. I mean, if you start seeing villages with no people with no injuries laying there dead uh this this is going to escalate and uh i don't know what uh i don't care i don't care about syria syria is an asshole country syria has been screwing with us for years so is iran but uh that's just something to we'll pay attention to it uh nothing real serious yet but i mean it, it all depends on assad you know and, and what he's willing to do which I don't know, but uh, that could get ugly over there. God bless those people, the innocent ones. Uh, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for letting me into your life for an hour. Uh, please go to the Facebook page and like it and participate there. Again, like I said at the top of the hour, it's uh, it's up to us now. You know, you can't just sit back on the couch. It's up to us. we got to influence more people. Uh, get out there and just, I mean, the truth will set you free. Most Americans, when they hear the truth, are already willing and able to engage. Uh, that's why I still think this is going to be a landslide. I still can't believe there's that many dumb college kids out there that uh, have been indoctrinated to the point and are so goddamn lazy that they can't look for information. Because that's another thing. It's a duty to engage in this, not just a, a hobby. This is a duty. You know, if, if you are entrusted with the power of a vote to change the, the course of history, then by God, you ought to go study it a little bit. You know, it's not a popularity contest. And I'm preaching to the choir, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not scolding anybody in the audience. I just get frustrated. Uh, so anyway, it's up to us. Send an email at uh, scrtv at live.com, scrtv at live.com. You can call the show at 412 Two five four thirty thirty seven fifty, and leave a message that's two minutes or shorter if you feel like it. If it's not ridiculous, I'll play it on the air. Uh, anyway, 
that's another week, and I can't think of anything else. Oh, Freedom Connector. Freedom Connector. Go to Freedom Connector. 100 million Patriots standing. Logan, Ohio. We'll shout out to you and to Steel City Resistance. And uh, again, thank you, John and Ann, for those heartfelt words. And uh, my energy level is, my tank is full, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, we're going to see this thing through. And we are winning, and we are going to win, and we are never going to quit. God bless you.